Hi, this is Geshe Michael Roach, and I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, congratulations uh, for finishing the Lamrim course. It was a long course, and I don't know, we were lucky that all of us had to stay in our houses. I've been in my house for, I don't know, maybe almost two months, and I haven't really gone out, so, you know, I'm not even going to the Sedona College to film this. I'm filming this at home. And boy, it's been a long retreat. And I don't know about you, but for me, it was kind of a, a good chance uh, to have a retreat. Uh, to be honest, like you guys, I didn't do perfect. You know, I didn't meditate all day or, you know, I, I also I ate a lot of ice cream and gained weight and looked at some Netflix every day. But in general, it was a very wonderful time and a very lucky time that we could have to have this long room retreat uh, with each other at home. And mainly I would like to thank uh, all of the people who helped, almost a hundred people, or over a hundred people have helped to make this long room retreat possible. The, the big cheese is the Tim Lowenhout uh, in Sedona, Arizona and the executive director of ACI. And he worked so, so hard. So you guys, uh, you should all send him uh, some kind of thanks and congratulations. And he, he really organized everybody. He had all the ideas for how to do this thing. And he did an amazing job, truly an amazing job. And it's helped people all over the world. So I'm very, very grateful to him. And I'm grateful to all of the people, translators, and other people who worked around the world. Uh, as I said, I think it's over 100 uh, volunteers who helped make this Lam Rim available around the world. And I got uh, wonderful comments from people. I got wonderful emails from many, many people. So thank you for that. Thank you for doing the Lam Rim. Uh, we were lucky, I think, that the subject uh, of the Lam Rim uh, was talking about impermanence and death and, and it was kind of very, very lucky. And many people lost family. Uh, many people lost friends, wrote to me. And, uh, and they were able to, to look at the alarm room and the alarm room helped them uh, to get through their losses and, and their problems all around the world. So again, I would like to thank uh, ACI and, and Tim Lohenhout and all the other guys who helped. Uh, today, my plan is just kind of to wrap everything up. Uh, we had a question and answer session earlier, uh, but there's still a lot of questions left that people sent us. And I thought I would go through, I don't know, five or six of those questions from around the world. And then I had a, quest, a special request, uh, mainly from Tim, I think, uh, you know, could I talk about uh, the special conditions that we need uh, to see emptiness directly and, and how, what's the best way that we could really have a chance uh, to see emptiness directly. And, and I've been thinking a lot about it because uh, one of the most important experiences during that time is to actually see uh, all the worlds there are, the countless worlds there are, and all the beings on those worlds. And I think if you have that experience, if you have had that experience in your lifetime, then uh, something like this virus, uh, it, it, it puts it all in a different perspective and, and you, are, you are in a different place about it. So I think it'd be wonderful if, if more people could see emptiness directly and have those experiences and it changes your whole life completely. It changes your outlook on life if you know this is not the only world around and uh, we are not the only people experiencing these things. And, and if, if you did meet a Buddha, if you knew Buddhas existed, then that would be, that would be really wonderful. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about practical things you can do to, to, to get that experience. So two parts today. One is questions. Uh, that we chose from many questions. And I'm sorry we can't answer all the questions that people sent, but we tried to pick uh, a, a variety of questions uh, from around the world. So, and then after that, maybe about halfway through this hour, uh, we'll start talking about 
you know, how to increase the, the chances that you can see emptiness directly and have this experience of, of other worlds and enlightened beings directly, which would change your whole life. And something like the virus would have a different meaning for you. Okay, uh, here's the first question. Uh, and it says, uh, a few years ago I had surgery and my uterus was removed. Uh, but I was able to save some of my eggs and I have a, an, uh, I have a chance uh, for surrogate parentage. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right thing to do because it seemed to me that maybe the surgery that I had was a sign uh, that I shouldn't have children and I shouldn't have a family and perhaps I should just focus on my spiritual development. Uh, also, uh, this whole experience has been very difficult for me psychologically and emotionally. And what are some seeds that I can plant to help me heal from this? So, I, you know, I was thinking about this answer and, uh, and I remember a couple of things. Uh, I, I, I remember, I, well, when just before I went into my own three year retreat, I think I've, I've told this story before. <laughs> Uh, just before I went into my own three-year retreat, uh, I gave a talk, I think in New York City. And somebody asked me about abortion, you know, and I said, well, in, in Buddhist belief, ancient Buddhist belief, uh, teachings by Lord Buddha, uh, it says, Miyam Mir Chakpa Sepa is the definition of killing, uh, which is to kill a human or a human fetus. Uh, after conception. So in, in Buddhism, uh, conception is considered already uh, a, a being, a living being. And, uh, and I myself uh, have been involved in an abortion when I was in college. So for me, it was a very important uh, question. And so I gave a talk like that in New York uh, before I did my own three-year retreat in, in 2000. And when I came out, I, I guess it was a year later, uh, I was asked to go back to New York and, and talk again. And I remember it was a very beautiful uh, spiritual center uh, in Manhattan. And they had sort of a large place and they had a nice waiting room. And, you know, I was just sitting there in a, in a very comfortable chair and it was very beautiful with the sunlight coming in and a very beautiful room. And then this young girl uh, just came in the room and, and she, she was going from one door to the other door. And uh, she just came in and she, I don't know, she was maybe four or five years old and she danced across the room. Uh, it looked like she had a ballet dress on or something. And, and it was so beautiful. Uh, it was like uh, some kind of uh, mystical experience to be sitting there. And this, this beautiful, uh, almost like an uh, angel, uh, dances across the room. And I was like, wow, that's beautiful. And then her mom came in, and her mom uh, saw me, and she, she's like, wow. And I'm like, hi. And, and she said, uh, I have to tell you something, Geshe Michael. And I said, what? And she said, well, you know, uh, before you went into your three-year retreat, you gave a talk about abortion. And uh, I was pregnant at that time. And uh, because of you, uh, I didn't have an abortion. And I had this child. The child you just saw is alive because of, of your teaching. And, uh, and this is the most precious thing in my life. In my whole life, this is the most precious thing. And I just want to thank you uh, for that. And then I, I had the thought in my head, you know, I said, uh, well, if I haven't done anything else good in my whole life, that's the one good thing I've done, you know, for sure. Uh, I've made someone really, really happy. And uh, my teacher, when I asked him about abortion, he, he said those things, you know, he said, he said it's two things. He said, uh, first of all, uh, it's a strange kind of killing because the other person doesn't have a chance to defend themselves. You know, if you walk down the street to your neighbor's house and you try to kill your neighbor, you know, at least your neighbor can try to fight you 
and defend themselves, but a child in the womb, uh, they cannot defend themselves. And so he said, for un, in his opinion, it was kind of unfair that uh, the, other, the other person didn't get a chance to fight back. Uh, and then he said, but the worst thing is, uh, you are preventing a, per, a being uh, from getting a human body, you know? And I, I had never heard that before. And he said, yeah, you, someone can use that body, you know? Somebody uh, would really need that human body. And if one being can have a human body, if you can cause one being to have a human body, then that's incredible. That's a, such a, that's the greatest gift you can give to any human being, any person, any living being, is to help them to get a new body, <laughs> help them to get a body. So uh, I, I was thinking about what he said. I was thinking about those two things when I was reading this question. You know, a lot of people say when something goes wrong, you know, uh, for, for example, when a child dies or something, uh, they, they think, oh, well, maybe it's a sign that I'm not supposed to have a family and uh, I'm supposed to have a spiritual life instead. Here it says, uh, should I focus on my spiritual development instead? So I, I'd, I'd say uh, it's quite the opposite, you know. Uh, I had my, my teacher had another student. I remember he had a, a, a very kind of a, a student who, who was kind of angry often and uh, unhappy and uh, caused problems a lot. And, uh, and I, I kind of watched him and he, he kind of helped the student uh, meet uh, a partner and he kind of encouraged them to get married in a way. And they had a child. And after they had the child, uh, I watched this person change completely. You know, they, they were already very, they knew all the scriptures and they knew all the Lamrim and they were a very good student. But after they had a child, they, it taught them compassion, I think. And, and I always thought my teacher must have planned the whole thing. So I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, if, if, if you choose to have a child and if you, think, uh, if you think that's the way that your life would go, uh, that it would be good for you, I think it would be an excellent spiritual practice. I think it would be a very deep spiritual practice. So uh, I... You know, it's very much uh, in the Bodhisattva tradition. And by the way, Lam Rim retreat number 36, which will be, you know, in July, uh, we're going to be doing it online again uh, because, uh, you know, we can't, we can't, can't travel yet uh, from the U.S. So, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about Bodhicitta. And, and Bodhicitta means... Uh, the true wish to help all living beings. And uh, if you can see emptiness directly, then your bodhicitta is a completely different experience. Uh, it's a, a totally different experience. So we're going to talk about that. But uh, in, in my opinion, uh, if you do have a child, and, and it's not for everybody. Uh, I, I haven't had a child, for example. But uh, if you do have a child, if you have the possibility to have a child, then it, it might be a very high spiritual practice. It might be a very, very good spiritual practice for you. So I, I, I would uh, think about it carefully. It's a big, big responsibility, but I do think it can open up your heart tremendously. And I, I would not take it as a sign uh, just because you had this operation that, that you shouldn't have a child. I, I think if we lived like that, we wouldn't do anything, I think. So... You know, if you wish to have a child, then I think be brave and make that your spiritual practice. It's definitely a, a, a spiritual practice you can do. Uh, so what should I do? What are some seeds I can plant to heal from this operation? And, and I've had this question many times from the same operation. And I can remember, I don't know, tw over 20 years ago, uh, someone came to me from... Ireland, I remember, and I was teaching in 
uh, Vienna. And I remember uh, one person came to me and, and asked me this question, you know, how can I heal from this kind of operation, this kind of an experience? And I encouraged uh, both the husband and the wife, uh, it was a husband and a wife, I encouraged both of them to, to go to a hospital, volunteer at a children's hospital. And, you know, and nowadays it's a little more difficult. You have to do probably do some training. You have to get permission. Uh, you have to pass some security questions and things like that. But if you have a chance uh, to work, uh, to volunteer in a children's hospital, and look, you're not going to be uh, probably a doctor, and you're not going to even be the nurse. Uh, they're probably going to ask you to clean the floor, or or something like that. And and they did, and uh, they just did it once a week on the weekend. They were very busy. They had their own business, and uh, but on the weekend they always went. And, and they, they volunteered at the children's hospital. And eventually, uh, with her eggs, they had another child. Uh, they had a second child. And uh, I remember they called her Angel, which was very beautiful. And uh, so I think, I think that, that would be a very wonderful thing to, to volunteer, uh, to do something for children, especially children who are not well. My own teacher, uh, I wanted to clean the bad seats from the abortion I had in college. And he encouraged me to start a, a children's Dharma study group. And we did. And of course, the parents, at least one parent was there each, every time we met. And we did that for 15 years. And it was an amazing group. It was an amazing opportunity. And, and I think it changed my seats. I think it was some beautiful seats that I got from that. So that's how I would deal with your problem. Here's another question from Taiwan. And basically, uh, this person has been studying Vipassana uh, meditation, and um, they've also been doing Niguma Yoga. And, and then they, uh, because they closed all the meditation studios, uh, they couldn't go to meditate in a group anymore. And they started doing the online course and they learned uh, some meditations during the Wheel of Life uh, online course. And they sort of felt like the Vipassana meditations they had been doing uh, were very helpful to them. And they also felt like the meditations they were doing during the Lam Rim, during the Wheel of Life course, were also very helpful to them. So they wondered, uh, will these two kinds of practices conflict with each other? Uh, is it okay to do both? And uh, it's a kind of a, a beautiful question because uh, I, I studied meditation. I learned meditation uh, in Asia. Uh, you know, my first meditation experiences uh, were in Asia. And I was with uh, a bunch of monks and... Uh, and we had a chance to go, I don't know, there were like 50 monks, and we had a chance to go to a, a meditation uh, class, a meditation course, a 10-day course. And uh, they said the teacher was very good. The teacher was from Burma, and he had been a businessman, and he had uh, studied meditation. And, and one of the monks, uh, like the boss monk, said, I think he's teaching very nice meditation. And I think we should all go. So we went, 50 monks, about 50 of us. Uh, we went for a 10-day course. And uh, the teacher was Goinka, okay? So that's the founder of Vipassana Meditation. And uh, I was fortunate that I guess my first big meditation experience was to study with Goinka for 10 day, a typical Vipassana course, 10 days of uh, in silence and no mail and things like that. And, and I had a wonderful time. And it really, really uh, taught me the value of meditation. And, and I think most of the monks who came, uh, they also had an amazing uh, experience. So, you know, and then, and then eventually he passed away, but, but uh, people are still teaching his system of Vipassana. 
And uh, so I think it's wonderful. I think it's a, a great uh, introduction to meditation. Uh, I, th I, think it, I think it's very uh, sweet. And I think it can be very helpful uh, to, to learn to sit, to learn to focus. I'm thinking about John Brady, who's the head of, uh, as you know, of, of all the input projects to save the ancient books. And by the way, Goenka was also very active in saving ancient books. And uh, John Brady, when I met him, was studying Zen meditation. He had studied with one of the best uh, Zen teachers in the United States, uh, a Japanese teacher. And uh, I always felt like it helped John's meditation practice a lot, that he had learned to sit, he had learned to focus his mind. And then he came to ACI, ACI he learned the Lamrim, and he learned the content, you know, like, like, so I would say like Vipassana and Zen oftentimes, or, or TM, Transcendental Meditation, I think they're very good. They can be very good for learning to focus your mind and learning to sit quietly. And they're very, very valuable for that. It's like developing a very good microscope uh, or a very good telescope, like, you, you get, it helps you to, to build up your instrument. And then, uh, you know, the Lam Rim teachers, Tsongkhapa and all those guys, uh, they say, well, then you have to put something in front of the telescope, you know? So it's no good to just keep a telescope in your house if you don't have something to look at with the telescope. So I think uh, all those traditions, Vipassana, Zen, TM, they can help you develop your telescope, you know, your ability to focus your mind. And then it's very, very important to learn the Lamrim so you have something to look at. It's like stars in the sky, you know, all of those topics, all of those subjects in the Lamrim, they're like stars in the sky and they are unbelievable. They are just incredible. So I think it's a good combination. Learn to focus your mind. Uh, learn to, to, to fix the mind and then learn the Lam Rim, uh, which will give you something to focus on. There are some meditation traditions. You know, I've been to many, many yoga classes around the world. When I first started doing yoga, which was exactly 20 years ago, uh, I told my yoga teacher, uh, you know, I travel a lot, so I, I don't know if I can do yoga every day. And they said, no, no, it's perfect, Geshe Michael. If you're traveling a lot, then every time you go to a new city, just look up online the nearest yoga studio and, and go take a class. And then you're going to get this great background in yoga. You know, you're going to study with good teachers all over the world. And you'll have a chance to, to find the yoga which really fits you. So I followed that advice. I have taken hundreds of yoga classes from many different places in the world and from some of the best yoga teachers in the world and some, from some of the worst yoga teachers in the world also. And uh, but what I can say is uh, there's a lot of strange meditations, you know, a lot of people uh, teaching yoga uh, never really had training uh, in meditation and they, they will teach some kind of meditation uh, which is often, I think, uh, it doesn't belong to a, a strong tradition. So uh, I, think it's, I think if you have not meditated or if you not already have a good tradition, I think the Lam Rim tradition of meditation is extremely good and extremely important. And we're going to talk about uh, how to use it to see emptiness because you need that telescope uh, to see emptiness directly. And... And I don't think you could get it uh, easily. It's, for example, if you just started to meditate in, in yoga studios, you know, you like a five-minute meditation before you do your yoga. Uh, it's not enough. Uh, it, it won't be enough uh, to, to use it for the most important things. But, you know, I, I think uh, if you already have a good Vipassana background, I think it can be very helpful. Um, so use that, develop your telescope, and then 
you must use it on something important. And you must use it on something that will help you and other people in an ultimate way. And that's the long rim. And I haven't seen uh, those kinds of stars uh, in other meditation traditions. I, I haven't seen those kinds of uh, things to meditate about uh, in other traditions. Uh, but the instrument you can, you can sharpen in other traditions and then bring it to your long rim practice. And, okay. Uh, here are some questions from Vietnam. Three great questions from Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnam guys, you are amazing. I know Mr. Bin and, and Nguyen and a lot of other people are, are helping out in Vietnam to teach people. And I think it's amazing uh, how strong the Vietnamese group has become. I think it's over 10,000 people. And your practice, it sounds very cool. It's, uh, and uh, every time I go there, it's amazing. Okay, here's another question. Uh, you've, you've been talking about how everybody wants to become a Buddha, and you've been talking about the karma that we have to make to become a Buddha, but in our normal day-to-day -day life, uh, we have other things we have to do, like make money for the family. Uh, we have to make sure the family's healthy. We have to take care of our own health. We have relationships uh, that we have to take care of. And my question is, if I have a serious illness or I get into some uh, financial problem, uh, should I focus on these problems and fix them first? Or uh, should I more focus on becoming a Buddha and keep that as my main focus or is it possible to do both at the same time? And uh, I think my answer, especially in the higher teachings, okay, and we're going to talk about that, in the highest teachings of, of Buddhism, Vajrayana, in the Diamond Way, uh, we are taught to use everything as part of our practice. So financial problems, uh, viruses around the world, uh, you know, taking care of our family. I just, uh, during the virus, I had a very sad thing happen in my house. Uh, so we had a dog uh, for many years uh, and he passed away during the virus time, not from the virus, but he's just very old. And, uh, and it was very, very sad, extremely sad and very hard for me and Veronica. And uh, so, yeah, uh, in the highest teachings, of Buddhism, you know, which are called Diamond Way or Vajrayana. Those teachings are interesting because they were started uh, when kind of these big business people and big politicians, uh, they came to the Buddha and they said, uh, you know, can you teach us some kind of Buddhism that would help us, you know, we don't have time to become monks. We can't sit in the forest meditating. Uh, we have families to take care of. We have businesses to take care of. Uh, we are taking care of whole countries or whole cities. Uh, can, you, can you teach us some kind of super Buddhism that we can become a Buddha uh, without becoming a monk, uh, just as a family person or as a business person or as a politician, is there a way that we can also become a Buddha? And Buddha uh, gave them these incredible teachings uh, called Vajrayana or Diamond Way. And, and I think as you study more and more, you will see, for example, the, the students who, 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 the students who asked the Buddha to teach the Diamond Cutter Sutra, for example, uh, there was one who was a big businessman and there was another one who was a, a politician. And the Buddha taught what I think is the most precious teaching he ever gave, uh, the Diamond Cutter Sutra, uh, to these, mainly because of these two guys. And so, yeah, uh, you know, Buddhism is not just for monks and nuns. I, I don't know how... Uh, we started to think like that. I don't think it was the Buddhist idea. Um, but the Buddhist idea was that, uh, especially if you can enter 
diamond way, uh, the higher teachings, uh, then uh, taking care of a family, uh, struggling to take care of your finances. You know, this morning I spent a big part of the morning uh, online learning to order my groceries online because I'm not allowed to go out. And uh, so I have become the grocery shopper in our house because uh, Veronica can't do it online. So <laughs> it's very funny. And uh, so I'm learning a lot. Uh, you know, I, first I'm studying Chandigirti, and then I was studying uh, Guna Prabha, and then I did a little bit of Vasubandhu, and then I did online groceries. And uh, they go very well together, okay? They really do go very well together. Uh, so don't, don't ever think that uh, there's a normal life and there's a spiritual life. Uh, that they are separate, that's, that's not, you are missing a great opportunity be, to become a Buddha, okay? Uh, living in the normal world is maybe the best opportunity to become a Buddha. Having a family, having a job, uh, it's probably the best opportunity to become a Buddha if you, especially if you can enter the higher teachings, the Vajrayana or Diamond Way. And the next question from Vietnam or, yeah, is something like, how can I uh, get to those higher teachings, you know, the budget, the Diamond Way teachings? Uh, there are three requirements for the secret teachings. Uh, there are a very famous uh, three requirements. And in fact, I was just teaching them a few days ago. So it's fresh in my mind. Uh, first one is Tumongilamgi Yujama, which means uh, you must learn the Lamrim, okay? You must, must master the Lamrim. Uh, it's the same as the 18 courses of ACI. You must start with that. In fact, you are, it's required. You cannot uh, start the higher teachings. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot enter that teachings uh, unless you mastered the Lamrim, Tumongi Lam Gyu Jawa. Uh, you must use the Lamrim to soften your mind and make it soft and ready to take the higher teachings. That's the first one. Uh, second one is called the Kushi Saban Tebe Wangshi Topa, Sinduri, Sinduri Kinkordu, okay, which means. Uh, in a, in a secret ceremony, okay, in a, in a ceremony uh, devoted to the diamond way, uh, people who have uh, been able to finish their Lamrim studies or their 18 ACI courses, then they are given four different blessings. There are four different uh, ceremonies uh, in which they get four seeds. Uh, are planted in their mind. And, uh, you know, so that you can say it's an empowerment, uh, but it has four different parts. And uh, each part of that empowerment will create a uh, part of the Buddha. Uh, and, and if you receive those four seeds, then in that lifetime, uh, you can become a Buddha. So it's very important to finish the Lamrim. Uh, many people came to me and said, uh, you know, Geshe I don't have time to do the 18 courses. You know, I, I don't want to do the 18. Can I just start with uh, this uh, super Buddhism? You know, can I start with this uh, diamond way? And in a few cases in my life, uh, I thought, well, this person seems special. And, and I'm going to try, I, I will let this person start uh, the diamond way teachings, which by the way is 18 other courses. So 18 more courses in the ACI curriculum. There are 18 foundation courses, which most of you know about. And then there are 18 higher courses uh, that require this kind of preparation. So, you know, but then I have allowed a few people to do those courses or, or to enter those courses without finishing the 18 ACI courses. And you know, I'm 67 years old now. I've been teaching for almost 50 years. And I can say that the people who did not prepare with the 18 courses, 18 ACI courses, about 
about nine out of 10 people fail. Uh, they fail in the, in the Diamond Way courses. So I can say, you know, from many years of experience, uh, I'm not helping you and, and, and it's not gonna be good for you if I give you some kind of shortcut or I say, you don't have to do the 18 uh, foundation courses, you know, uh, you must do them. And, and then you will be successful. Then you can start your diamond weight teachings and, and you will be successful. Now, this person said, you know, how am I going to get these teachings? I, you know, after I finished the 18 ACI courses, well, then you have to, you know, talk to your ACI teacher. Uh, you can always write to Tim Lowenhout uh, at the ACI headquarters, a home office. And, there have been many people in many countries. Uh, they said, we are ready, for example, in Mexico, uh, we have a great ACI group. Uh, they studied their 18 courses and then they contacted the home office and they said, you know, can we get some Diamond Way courses down here? And Tim arranged it and they, ha they are doing great. Those students are really, really doing well. Uh, with the Diamond Way courses. John Brady's been going down there. Uh, Venerable Ellie's been going down there. Tim's been going down there. A lot of people have been helping to teach the Diamond Way courses. So finish your 18 courses. And if you do a good job, you'll have enough good seats that Tim will have to send you uh, a good Diamond Way teacher. Okay, I'm gonna just do one more question. Let's see here. Yeah, okay, one last question. This one's actually from Mexico. Uh, so when we are doing uh, an ACI meditation, then we have these preliminary steps, you know, Yen Lak Dun is called the seven preliminary steps. And uh, personally, when, when people start going through those seven uh, steps, I kind of lose my, my way. Like I, I'm, maybe I'm watching my breath and uh, I start, my mind starts to wander. And, uh, you know, it's hard for me. For example, in one of those steps, you're supposed to make an offering to your teacher. So, you know, when I follow Geshe Michael on the video, the long room video. And then he's sitting there for five minutes and I guess he's offering to his teacher. I lose, I lose it, you know, for four minutes, I'm not really thinking about offering to my teacher. And it reminds me of a teacher I knew about. Um, and he was a, uh, he is an amazing teacher. And, uh, and I've also taken many teachings from him. And uh, when he goes on an airplane, you know, they take off and after half an hour, they serve everybody their food, you know. And he travels a lot on airplanes. And, and I talked to his assistant and his assistant was laughing. I said, you know, how does he do his food offering? You know, what prayers does he use? Because there's lots of famous prayers that we use to offer our food, you know? And I said, well, what, what prayers does he like to do? And then his assistant laughed and he said, oh, you don't want to be on an airplane with him. You don't want to, you don't want to do that, you know? And don't do it, Geshe Michael. And I'm like, why, you know? And he said, you know, if it's a two hour flight, <laughs> then after half an hour, they bring the food and he starts his offering prayers. Uh, he starts to offer the food and I'm his assistant. I'm sitting next to him. I also have to focus on the offering prayers and he will do the offering prayers for one and a half hours and we won't eat the food and the flight attendant will come and say, okay, we're landing now. Uh, I, I have to take the food back. I'm sorry you didn't like the food. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my friend said, I don't know how he can focus for, for an hour and a half on just offering, you know, this spaghetti or something. I, I don't know how he can do it, you know, like that. And uh, so I guess that's my answer about uh, when you do your seven preliminaries. Uh, 
if the time's not up, you know, if I'm following another teacher who's guiding a meditation, then I will just go deeper into the offering. For example, uh, I will start uh, by offering uh, my teacher, I don't know, a piece of fruit in my mind, you know. So my teacher likes fruit. And uh, in the mind, uh, I will offer an apple and I will think about it and make it beautiful and I will offer this apple. And then if, if the person leading the meditation is still doing the offering, okay, then I will, I will start to do Samantha Badra's offering, uh, which is uh, you fill the whole sky with roses and other kinds of flowers, lotus flowers, and I will cover this part of the sky like over Russia. And if I finish that, I will cover the sky over Vietnam. And if I finish that, I will go to the sky over Mexico. And then I'll make different flowers. And so you can always go deeper in a meditation. So I think that it's important to not let your mind uh, lose the focus, you know, keep the focus on the offering, make the make it deeper and deeper and more detailed. When I do the lion's dance and I'm supposed to be thinking about my past life and I finish, you know, I got my past life. I'm thinking about my past life. The person is clear. Uh, what they are doing is clear. I'm waiting for the teacher to go on, you know, uh, and I still have time. So then I will go deeper. So, so you have to learn how to do that, you know, go deeper. Don't start uh, daydreaming, you know, don't start thinking about lunch. Uh, go deeper into the story, you know, then make a whole new scene about the story of this past life. And, and so like that, you can always go deeper. So don't let go of the object, and whether it's an offering or a past life and just start to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, so those are the questions, and I'm sorry for all the people. Many, many people wrote questions. I couldn't answer all of them, uh, but I'm happy to try. Uh, I encourage you to see the Peachtree Morning Show. Uh, five days a week, we answer questions of people who write in, and they ask questions about their life, and I think uh, it's a cool thing to do when you're having breakfast, you know. So we, we're also having coffee or some donuts, and we're talking about people's questions. So uh, if you have more questions, perhaps you could send them into the Peachtree Show, and slowly we can get to your question. Okay, we have about 20 minutes left, right, Tim? And uh, let's talk about, you know, how can I increase the odds, how can I get a better chance to see emptiness directly in this life? Like what, what are some things I can do to get myself more ready, you know, like, uh, and I, I just want to say it's extremely cool uh, to see emptiness directly. It's extremely wonderful. It's the best thing that can happen in your whole life. Okay. I can say that I've lived a very long life. And I've had many, many happy, cool things in my life, many. But the coolest thing uh, would, is to see emptiness directly. There's nothing else like it, you know. And imagine, you know, you're living in a world like this world right now, and the virus has spread uh, throughout the world. It's a, it's a very amazing situation, you know, in the Lam Rim. Uh, we try hard to get a good death meditation. You know, we try so hard. We try for years and years and years to do death meditation because death meditation is supposed to wake me up. And uh, death meditation is supposed to free my heart and open my heart and open my mind. And, and then I will do what's very important in life. I will do the most important things in life. And we're also lucky to have this virus, you know, uh, around us, you know. Uh, two months ago when we were filming the Lam Rim, me and Tim uh, and Stanley, uh, we were filming the Lam Rim at the college. Uh, two months ago, the virus had not really reached uh, the United States, but now we are number one. Uh, I don't know, because Americans are so stubborn. 
uh, they will not stay in their house and they will not, nobody likes to wear a mask. And so many people have died and I, and I know uh, people who have died. You know, I usually help to do the prayers for people who die and I'm busy all day uh, doing prayers uh, for people who died. There's, every day there's a new email about uh, someone who, who passed away. So really, uh, we can say uh, that the virus has been an amazing lam rim. So you and me, Tim and Stanley and all of us, we did a good lam rim course. Uh, we did a great uh, two-month course. We had lots of great lam rim. But the world had a great lam rim course at the same time called virus, you know, <laughs> COVID virus. And kind of the whole world, I think for the first time uh, in hundreds of years, uh, the whole world was doing a death meditation. The whole world uh, was thinking and is still thinking about I, I might die in the next week. When my groceries came today, uh, I had to clean each one, one by one, you know, each apple, uh, each orange, I had to clean them one by one. And so we're all thinking about uh, death. And imagine that you're on a world like this. And, you know, everyone deep down is afraid. There's a very, very high uh, mental illness right now in the world. You know, the, now the, the doctors have been busy. The medical doctors have been very busy for two or three months. But now... I don't know, I think every country, the psychiatrists are very busy, the psychologists are very busy because many, many people are depressed. Uh, many, many people have had breakdowns. Uh, in America, many, many people are fighting and in the home. Uh, the violence in the home between husband and wife is the highest it's been ever. And so people are worried, uh, people are tired of, of, of quarantine. I'm also tired. <laughs> Me and Tim were talking. Uh, he went to, on a car trip for 45 minutes. So I told him, no, no, I went on a car trip for one hour. And that was so exciting, you know. And uh, me and Veronica went to a car trip. And, and in this moment, right, imagine how it would feel if you could watch a thousand other planets, you see? Imagine how you would feel on this planet uh, where every person is, is worried about this virus. Imagine if at the same time you could see a thousand other worlds and, and if you knew uh, you would be the teacher on each one. You see, that's so cool. Like imagine you are the Lamrium teacher in your city and then imagine that you are the alarm room teacher for your country. And then imagine you are the alarm room teacher for a whole world. And then try to imagine you are the alarm room teacher for thousands and thousands of worlds that you can see directly. And then how would it feel uh, to be free of a single world? How would it feel to, you know, I, I really enjoy my life. <laughs> on this world uh, because uh, I, I have the opportunity to travel uh, constantly. You know, I've been to many, many countries. I have friends that I love very much in many, many countries. I'm so lucky. And I've learned how delicious is the spices of each country. You know, each country's different people are, are different and interesting and fun for me. And we have become close, close friends. And imagine that it's that way for many worlds, you see, not for one country or two countries or 20 countries or 100 countries. But imagine uh, you are playing in, a, in a many worlds on many planets, you know, imagine that. And that's kind of my sales pitch for seeing emptiness directly, you know. You can't imagine how much fun it is uh, to play on a thousand worlds at the same time uh, and how much, it, how much different it is than living on, on one world, okay? Uh, try, try to imagine. Uh, so you can do it and, and you can reach 
you can go there and 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 if you study the alarm room well uh you can go there you know we're going to have a translation class i guess tim is this showing before the translation class yeah uh may 19th no okay <laughs> anyway uh listen to the ancient books you know just listen so i say i'd say the first thing get excited about seeing emptiness emptiness is like a door that you have to go through to to see all these worlds to to experience you know i remember i took my teacher to brazil and i took him to the great beaches in rio de janeiro uh, ipanema and he was like oh man this is so cool you know so just imagine uh that you could go to to many thousands of worlds uh but you just have to go through that door you just have to see into this directly so here are some things you should do and i just have about 5 minutes to i'll just i'll just make a list of them for you uh so number one study 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 and after that you should study 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 and after that you should study 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 okay there are 300,000 great books of this tradition john brady is rescuing them and each one of them is amazing okay each one of them is a passport to a thousand worlds so in my opinion <laughs> if you don't take advantage of those books if you don't learn them and read them uh, there's a lot of new books coming out from the translation group the mixed nuts translation group you got to look at them every day you got to just read a little bit every day that's the very first thing you have to do okay that you got to do that all right number 2 you know if you know lamrium you have to find a great teacher you have to find a good teacher okay uh you have to find a real tradition and the lamrium is a real tradition the lamrium is the real thing and if you study it uh you can reach that goal everything is there the lamrium is complete so just keep studying lamrium go to the knowledge base go to the old lamriums uh study 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 listen 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 put it on in your car you know put it on at breakfast put it on when you have some free time and study okay so you got to do that and you got to have A, a living teacher okay it's not enough i don't know a book is not enough a video is not enough you got to have a connection with a real person and and aci has a lot of great teachers and you know there will be teachers who can come to where you live and all of us are very happy to to help you okay uh next thing i would say is service okay you have to uh take care of people where you live okay there are old people everywhere there are sick people everywhere there are hungry people everywhere there are poor people everywhere and just make it part of your life that you take care of them every day okay i don't know one hour or something you know drive a old person i know uh, ellie venerable ellie she you know she's been studying lamrim for i don't know 30 40 years and she she still drives old people to the grocery store every week you know she gets in her car and she goes to pick up poor people and she takes them uh to the grocery store and, and she waits for them while they're by their groceries and here's this person who's in charge of a big organization and uh you know she can go teaching all over the world and uh she can meditate she she knows all the books she helped to translate the diamond cutter sutra that we just finished <clears throat> but still she's getting in her car uh, every week and she gives a couple hours to the older people and she's busy uh she has a lot of things to do but she serves people so if you want to see emptiness directly uh study 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 uh, find a great teacher and serve people uh I, and then it, you cannot see emptiness directly unless you are meditating every day and 
you know, those of us who are these ACI teachers, DCI teachers, you know, if we're very honest to you guys, there are times in my life when I stopped meditating, okay? Like I, I didn't meditate for a while. I got lazy. I got busy. I thought I will meditate next week or something like that. So everybody who's studying Narmim, everybody, uh, we all have times in our life when we don't meditate very well or we're too busy. So what to do, okay? Then get your, you know, what's it called, that app? <laughs> uh, Inside Timer, I love it, you know? Probably the name came from the Vitasa group, I don't know. But uh, get the Inside Timer, okay? I got, I use mine all the time. Uh, this, this timer, get this timer, the inside timer, and set it for 10 minutes and meditate for 10 minutes, okay? Okay, if you're like me and you had times in your life when you, you start meditating for, for three days or for three weeks, and then you have to get back on the horse, okay? You have to go back, get your inside timer out, and set it for 10 minutes and just meditate for 10 minutes. Every Sunday, increase one minute, okay? Every Sunday, increase one minute. Don't do an hour on the first day. It's not going to work, okay? If you haven't been meditating, if you never did meditate or you've stopped meditating, uh, you know, you got busy, then start back. You have to start back at the beginning. Start back at 10 or 15 minutes, okay? And then once a week, increase it by one minute. And then, you know, pretty soon, uh, you're doing an hour, okay? Within, within you know, nine, 10 months, uh, you'll be doing an hour every day. And to be honest, uh, you cannot see emptiness directly if you are not meditating one hour a day. If you cannot meditate deeply for one hour a day, I don't think you can see emptiness directly, okay? Uh, it, it won't happen. So, so that's, a, that's the other thing I would do. You have to be on the cushion at least one hour a day. Don't start with one hour a day because you will quit after three days, okay? So go to 10 minutes and just pick it up there and one more minute every week. And you definitely, you'll be able to meditate for an hour, okay? Uh, lastly, I would say, well, a couple things. Uh, eat well, okay? Uh, don't eat junk. Uh, just learn to eat well. Uh, do some yoga. Learn some yoga if you can, okay? Uh, I hate yoga. I don't like exercise. But it keeps me alive. And it kept me healthy for 67 years. I mean, in the last 20 years. <laughs> So do some exercise every day. Try to get outside under the blue sky. Uh, try to get outside, go for walks, you know, and take care of your body because without a body, you cannot see emptiness directly. So those are my suggestions. Uh, number one, study, study, study. After that, study, study, study. Study every day. Study something every day. The knowledge base has 5,000 teachings on it. Don't tell me you can't find something to study. Uh, they're free. Okay, and they're in many, many languages. The knowledge based org, I guess. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, you know, find a good teacher, have a relationship with a good teacher, uh, and then uh, take care of, serve old people, serve sick people, serve poor people. Do something every week to serve people. And then you must meditate regularly. And uh, you must take care of your body. You, your body is like a rental car. When you're born, it's like you went to the airport and you rented a car. And you're stuck with this car for your whole life. If this car breaks down, uh, you can't see emptiness directly. It's not possible. So you got to take good care of your body. Eat well. Uh, get good sleep. Watch a little bit of Netflix, but not much, okay? Uh, set a limit and stop. It's important to relax. Uh, it's important to rest. Personally, I work hard until 9 o'clock, and then I say, okay, Geshe Michael, you can watch TV. 
and I'll watch Netflix or something. And so work hard and then take a rest. Uh, take a rest when you have to take a rest. And that's all. And pray uh, to the teachers of the Lamrim lineage. Uh, you know, take some time, pray, ask them for help. That's how the great Lamrim of Tsongkhapa was written. Uh, he prayed uh, for the help of the Lamrim teachers in history. And they came to him and they helped him to see emptiness directly. Okay. So that's my advice. I look forward to seeing you at the next online Lam Rim. Uh, we're going to do it. We were supposed to be doing it in Mexico in July. We can't go. Uh, so we'll be doing it online and we'll get in touch with you. And again, I would like to thank the many, many, many people around the world who worked so hard uh, to make this Lam Rim available to everyone. All of the translators, uh, all of the people helping with the online you know, programs and things like that. Uh, it's amazing how many people helped. And especially I'd like again to thank Tim Lohenhout uh, for working so hard to make this happen. Thank you and see you at the next Lumrim.